few days. I mean, they'd been with him for three years. Lived with him, camped out under the stars with him. Been with him through thick and thin. And they had watched the power of heaven come down around them. Sometimes at the most unexpected times, it shocked even them. Other times they felt and sensed the build-up to what was getting ready to happen, the opening the eyes of the blind. But the raising of the little girl, it shook them to their core. The raising of the rabbi's son stunned them. The raising of Lazarus blew him away. But the thing that they just couldn't quite grasp, and the scriptures say this, for three years he told them what he had come for. He started gently at first, because at first it was all new to them. He chose them. He picked them. He discipled them. Sent them out two by two to minister in his name. And all of the things that they had done and witnessed had not prepared them for that moment. He told them over and over why he'd come. And that eventually his coming, his mission, would take him to a cross. He would be handed over, he said, to the authorities. They would crucify him, he said. They couldn't wrap their heads around it. They were with him was not a deceitful person. He didn't, he wasn't a criminal. He, he wasn't a liar. People were attracted to him. Tens of thousands of people would show up eventually as his ministry went on. Who would crucify him? In his very words, he brought heaven down to them. Power of his voice. Peace, be still, and the elements obeyed him. Ten thousand hungry people fed with a few loaves of bread and a few fish just because he spoke it and says, Go feed them. All of those things made it impossible for them to believe. that he would be crucified. But he didn't just end it there. He said, they will deliver me up and they will crucify me. But on the third day, I will be raised to life. When you look at it in context and you read the admissions of the gospel writers about their basic misunderstanding or disbelief of that last part. They didn't want to believe that he would go to a cross. They certainly couldn't even fathom that somehow after being crucified, and no one survived a Roman crucifixion. No one. How could he be raised to life again? Perhaps he meant spiritually. Perhaps he meant in their hearts. Perhaps he meant they would feel him even after he was gone. But still, they didn't even want him to be gone. What in the world did he mean? What in the world was this? He was Messiah. He was supposed to deliver them from the Roman government. <laughs> I mean, he had come to defeat a much larger and diabolical kingdom 
kingdom of darkness. It needed to be separated from the kingdom of light. And the only way that separation was going to occur was through his own blood. So that day finally came. The Wednesday night of that week that we are commemorating this week, the days don't line up with that week 2,000 years ago, but we're commemorating it. That's what this Sunday is about. Commemoration of Resurrection Sunday, the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, the fulfillment of the Feast of Passover. Because it was during that feast that Jesus went in through the Eastern Gate. After on the Wednesday of that night, they had, they had shared a Passover meal together. Under the Jewish law, it was perfectly acceptable to eat that meal a day early because of all of the people that were coming by foot in and out of the city for the Passover celebration, over a million people there. And he also knew, he knew, he knew that he was getting ready to actually become the Passover lamb. So that Wednesday evening in our time, they took the Passover together. The disciples sat down. They'd already been through a few with him. They thought, well, here, this is another one. This is great. And he took the bread that evening and he broke it and he blessed it. And he says, now, this has always been about me. This unliving bread, I am the bread of life. In just a little while, you will see my body given for you. This bread represents that. I'm sure they looked at each other. There he goes again. My body will be given for you. Take and eat it. Eat it all. And every time you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And then they ate together. Then he took the cup of the covenant, which was a part of the Passover meal, the covenant God had made with his people originally at Sinai, but to be made anew at what he was getting ready to do. The new covenant was on its way. He took that cup of the covenant and he said, this represents my blood, which I am getting ready to shed and to pour out for you and for all who would come under it. Take it and drink it. Consume it. You become a part of me. Let me become a part of you. And every time you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. That was the Passover. It was totally different from any Passover they had ever taken before because now Jesus was personalizing it. He was telling them, this has always been about me. The whole Passover coming out of Egypt under the blood put on the door frame in the shape of a cross with a hyssop branch. Go through the door, get under the blood that looks like a cross, and you will be saved. They had been selling that, celebrating that for 1,500 years. And on that night, Jesus said, in effect, it has always been about me. The Passover lambs in the temple, they're being prepared even tonight for the big day tomorrow. Because at sundown tomorrow night, Thursday night, which would get into our Friday, at sundown that night, the Passover meal will be served. And all who have not already eaten it under the law like we have will be seated on Passover day. They'll be going through the ritualistic Passover meal. But by then, I will have already become the Passover lamb. And on that Thursday evening at 3 o'clock, he cried out after six hours on the cross, It is finished. Thursday night in the tomb, Friday night in the tomb, Saturday night in the tomb, and early Sunday morning on the third day, the women went to prepare his body. 
from Thursday night to Friday night is one day. From Friday night to Saturday night is two days. From Saturday night to early Sunday morning is on the third day. Over and over, he told him, three nights I will be in the grave, but on the third day, I will rise again. They still couldn't wrap their heads around it. We see it in the scriptures. Not only do the, the scripture writers say that that's the way they understood it and felt, but then we see what happened. After that Passover meal, they go out into the Garden of Gethsemane. The curse on all humanity was reversed right there. Paul calls him the second Adam had come. The first one had lost it all. How did he lose it? Because Satan, Adam, Eve, basically had said to the Lord, not your will, but ours. On that night, he knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane, right outside the temple, at the foot of the Mount of Olives, and he prayed, not my will, but yours. The curse had been reversed. The soldiers were coming, led by Judas, who was possessed of Satan himself. Jesus had already said it. You could see the torches bobbing up and down as they traversed their way to the garden. You know how I know that they still didn't understand? Peter grabbed his sword. He was going to kill everybody. But this is what Jesus had come for. He was able to catch the ear of one of them before Jesus put a stop to the whole thing. They still didn't understand. Then they fled. They dragged Jesus in for a mockery of a trial in the middle of the night to the high priest's home, an illegal trial with paid off witnesses. Glad nothing like that happens now, aren't you? They condemned him to death, but they had to get the permission of the Roman government. So by the next morning, they had him in Pilate's office, the governor. I'm not excusing Pilate, but, but you can see in the scriptures, he really tried hard not to have that whole thing happen. He figured if I beat him within an inch of his life, maybe that'll suffice. So they did that that didn't satisfy the Sanhedrin. The scripture said that he finally just went to a big vat of water, washed his hands in front of the whole crowd, and basically said, I'm washing my hands of this. And they led him out to crucify him. The men, the 12, minus Judas now, Ten of them we get from the scriptures, they ran and hid. They figured they would be next. They saw it was all coming to light. Now they were beginning to understand he really was going to the cross, but they didn't. They couldn't stop it. They wanted to stop it. They didn't know what to do. They had to go. And so they hid. John, the Bible says, was the only one that made it to the foot of the cross that day. He watched the whole thing in horror. Jesus' own mother was there. Some of the women that had followed him, Mary Magdalene, others, they were there. They weren't the ones being hunted down, or at least that's what the guys thought. And for six long, grueling hours, they watched David had seen it in a vision a thousand years earlier, Psalm 22. It's as though he became Jesus. He described things that never happened to him, but he described 
he says, oh my gosh, they have pierced my hands and my feet. They surround me like dogs. They say he saved others, let him save himself. Psalm 22, a thousand years before it happened. They gamble for my clothing. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. I can see all of my bones. They look at me and they stare. My joints are pulled apart. They have pierced my hands and my feet. And it was happening. And John watched it. Isaiah, 700 years earlier, you heard me read it a little while ago. I didn't just pull that out of my back pocket. There's a reason for it. You'll see even deeper in a moment. But let me just remind you again. 700 years before, he saw it. He said, oh my gosh, I see the one. The people have turned on him. Now they despise him. Now they're blaming him for something that's going on. They're saying God is punishing him. How can this be? They're laying stripes upon his back. And by those wounds, somehow I'm being told by the Spirit that is our healing. But I don't understand it. He says, and then I see he is being pierced for our transgressions wounded for our iniquities and the punishment that he's taking is ordained from heaven and it will bring peace to us and he's being killed between thieves now they're coming for his body they're going to take him to a rich man's tomb it's Isaiah 700 years yet he will see the light of life Isaiah says I see it he comes back he rises he sees the light of life I wonder if any of that went through John's head or any of those Jewish people that knew the word of God while they watched that day I, I don't know Jesus had told them it would be like that and now they're watching it so they waited his tomb was sealed Roman guards were placed there I'm sure temple guards were nearby as well they couldn't let that body be moved or stolen some of the crowds had heard him say that he would rise again. They couldn't let that happen. So the whole world waited, basically. Most of the world didn't care. Most of the world didn't even know exactly what was going on and had moved on with their lives. You know how we are. It's a tragedy one day. Give it a couple of days and we forget about it. And the world kept going. And the planet spun around in a 24-hour cycle. Two times. And then in the middle of that third spin on the third day, the women, the women went back to the tomb. They weren't looking for a resurrection. The Bible's clear about that. Friday after that Thursday was a special Sabbath. It was Passover, and right after that, it was it, that was also the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, no work was to be done on those Sabbaths or special Sabbaths. And then the next day, Saturday, was the normal Sabbath. So, those days were out for them getting to the tomb. But early on Sunday morning, that was the perfect time. But it was at just the right time because by the fourth day decay would set in. So by the third day, early on the third day, they had to get there to anoint the body with spices. They talked all the way in, I'm sure, about how they were going to convince those Roman guards to let them do this. 
surely they would do that under guard, allow a couple of women to go in. The guys weren't there. There'd be no rough housing. There'd be no tricks. So they were thinking about that and talking about that. And on their way to the tomb, the earth moved. A large cracking noise filled the air and there was a tremor. Dogs started barking. People started screaming all through the city and the whole earth moved. It was an earthquake. Not unusual for that area, even to this day. But at that moment, not only was it frightening, it became a bit surreal. After the panic had settled, they made their way closer to the tomb and they couldn't believe what they saw. The guards had fled, obviously, in haste. They were nowhere to be found. The stone was rolled open. And the gospel writers say this, that the women saw at that moment a flash of blinding light. And the only thing they could describe later was, it was a heavenly being, it was an angel, dressed in sparkling white, with a flash of light like lightning, they described it, blinding light, light, and a voice that said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He has risen. Just as he told you he would. The women left that blinding light. They rushed back to tell the guys. A blinding light. It was the first day of the week. gone. We know the rest of the account. We know what happened. We know the appearances of him to the two on the Emmaus, Emmaus Road, to the women eventually at the tomb that day as they lingered and kept looking and couldn't believe what they saw. Then that same evening in the upper room in front of the disciples, then a week later on that same evening, John tells us, on the first day of the week, both of those nights, he appears again. Thomas was there that time, who said, I will not believe. He said this before. He was just among them. He said, I will not believe what you're telling me about him rising and about you seeing him. I will not believe it until I see the, the nail scars in his hands, the spear scar in his side. I cannot believe. This is beyond my imagination. This is horrible what has happened. You're making mockery of it by claiming you've seen him alive. He said, I will not believe Thomas. Turn around. In that upper room, he looks. How did he get there? It's like he came through a dimension. He's standing in their midst. Jesus said, I believe that's what you're looking for. See here my side? Behold my hands. Thomas fell in a position of worship before him. And in Hebrew, he would have said, Yahweh Elohim, my Lord and my God, my creator Elohim. Now he believed. <laughs> Jesus bent over and whispered in his ear, Thomas, I love you. But blessed are those who have not seen what you just saw, but they will still believe one day. Blessed are those. Watch this. 
blinding light, the earth moving, the angel that looked like a strike and flash of lightning, the booming voice, he is not here. The prophets. Isaiah, yet after the suffering of his soul, he will see, here it goes again, the light of life. Now I want to take you all the way back to the beginning. The very first words. In English, there are 10 of them. We translate it from the Hebrew, the very first verse. In English, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ten. But in the very first verse, in the very first book of the Bible, those same words in Hebrew in which it was written, there are precisely seven words. Seven. Seven words in the first verse. Seven words that speak of the creation. Seven days of the creation. Seven, 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 seven. In the book of Revelation alone, we find the number seven almost 50 times. Every time it is used, it is used to speak of perfection and completion. Seven words. Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashamayim vayet haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now watch. Then God said, let there be light. And he separated the light from the darkness and there was evening and there was morning. The first day of the week there was a burst of light because God said let it be. The first day of the week, the first day of the universe, the first day of earth, the first day of creation was marked by a burst of immeasurable light. Isaiah had said, and on that first day of the week, after his soul has suffered, he will see the light of life. The women went to the tomb on the first day of that week and saw a flash of light that was like lightning. And an angel said, he is not here. He has risen. When God spoke and said, let there be light, it was on the first day of the week. It was the first thing he created. Elohim, the creator. But I love what Colossians tells us later. Speaking of Jesus himself, Colossians says this. He, Yeshua, he is the image of the invisible God. He is God in the flesh, in other words. And by him, the universe was made. By him, all things that were created were created. They were created by him, and they were created for him. And in him, everything holds together. Now go back to Genesis 1. Bereshit bara Elohim et 
השמיים ואת הארץ. That was Jesus, y'all. By him all things were made. That was God. God who would put on flesh. But we can say that was him because Colossians says that was him. And the first thing he creates on the first day of the week is a blinding light that separates the darkness and destroys it. The first verse is a veiled prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The light. All of life is about where we are today and it's all hinged on what happened in Genesis 1 and what has happened ever since and what's still happening and what's going to happen. But in the middle of it all, is the trumpet of heaven sounding saying there is hope it is finished God has won Jesus Christ has triumphed and if you will come under his blood you too will be healed you too will be saved you too will be secured and like he told the thief on the cross next to him that day that he cried out Adonai remember me this is what he will say to us I tell you the truth on this very day you will be with me in paradise like it was from the beginning. Do you see? Do you understand? That's what this day is about. That's what the celebration of this day is about. That's why we gather back every Lord's Day. It's like we're the women going back to the tomb. We gather back as a group and we stand around and we sing our praises before the angels in heaven. And we worship him and we expect and we wait. We get up, we leave, we go out into the world, we share the good news with anybody that wants to hear it, but we go out into the darkness because now Jesus says we're the light, right? We carry it. But in the meantime, if we're under the blood, we're in covenant with the creator. He's made it right. This is not about religion. It's about a relationship with our Creator, restored like it was in the beginning. It's about light bursting into our life. It's about light bursting into our understanding. It's about the coming kingdom of everything being made right. I know there are a lot of people here this morning, probably everybody, if you have any age on you whatsoever, maybe some of the littlest children haven't tasted of all of this yet, but some have. But everybody here can identify with grief, pain, sorrow, death, with anger that this world has taken something from us or is trying to take something from us. Anger that we sometimes can't seem to control our mind or our mouth or even our flesh. Anger that we fight it and we still struggle. Anger that something is wrong with all of us and with all of this world. But here's how the Word of God ends. Revelation 21. John said, and when I was taken up, I saw the throne of God. And after the end of all things and the great white throne and the judgment and Satan destroyed and the Antichrist destroyed and the world system of depravity is destroyed, he said, I saw a throne and I saw him who sat upon it. And I heard him say, Behold, 
Now the dwelling place of God is back with his children. And he shall be with them and they will be with him. The creator, their heavenly father, their best friend. <laughs> they will be together again. And on that day, there'll be no more pain, no more crying, no more mourning, no more death. God says, because I have made all things new. So whatever Satan has taken from you or whatever he plans to take from you, God has promised if you're under the blood of his son. See, that's what this whole thing's about. He will make it right. And you will worship him when you see what he does for you. You will worship him when you see what he has done. All of a sudden, like those disciples standing at the tomb and then being in that room, and there he is. They didn't understand any of it to the depth of it they needed to until they saw him that they understood. Then on that day, we'll understand. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ. You have always been. You still are. And you will always be Lord of all. That's what this day is about. That's why we're here. That's why, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Let's dismiss with a word of prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for a brand new book from critically acclaimed best-selling author, Pastor Carl Gallup's The Yeshua Protocol, an explosion of divine revelation for our unique generation. Carl Gallup's takes you on a whirlwind tour through the scripture like you've never experienced. Discover the undeniable Yeshua codes buried within the pages of the Old Testament. Learn the inescapable reality that every living cell in creation is encoded with the very name of God. And be shocked when you see what has been secretly lying within the pages of the Bible that allows you to see Yeshua as you've never before fathomed him. The Yeshua Protocol mentions a wide variety of topics such as quantum physics, ancient Hebrew letter meanings, the latest archaeological finds, and Yahweh's name encoded upon our very own DNA. Do you really cover all of these topics in the book, The Yeshua Code? All of those and many more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're living in incredible times. And, and you know, you speak of, for example, internet technology and all that that entails. You know, I describe it as we are looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil.